Overview of Participatory Approaches. This module introduces and explores key public participatory approaches and tools, including citizen science, open data initiatives, hackathons and gaming, collective ideation, and co-creation tools. In section one, we'll become acquainted with the evolution and use of participatory approaches. We'll also learn about implementation challenges. In section two, we'll discuss the details of participatory methods and their applications with specific examples. In section three, we'll explore how in a project, different participatory methods and tools can be used in combination to achieve project objective and results. Please familiarize yourself with the structure of the module. In section one, we'll become acquainted with the evolution and use of participatory approaches. We'll also learn about implementation challenges. Participatory approaches include a range of activities with a common thread, enabling ordinary people to play an active and influential part in decisions that affect their lives. Through these approaches, they can take part in creating solutions for common issues. This means that people are not just listened to, but also heard. Their voices shape outcomes. Participatory approaches are a product of interactions between researchers, development workers, government agents, and local populations over several decades. The history of participatory methods in development cooperation began in the late 1970s with the introduction of a new research approach called rapid rural appraisal, which immediately became popular with decision makers in development agencies. Building on close collaboration with local populations, these rapid rural appraisals were designed to collect first-hand data from local people about their perceptions of their local environments and living conditions in rural areas. Rapid rural appraisals were usually conducted as one to three days workshops with villagers in the field, facilitated by small teams of specialists. Rapid rural appraisal methods were specifically adapted to respond to local conditions. Communication processes with persons who were unable to read were considered using visualization like locally comprehensible symbols and tools such as mapping, pro diagramming, and ranking. A limitation of rapid rural appraisal, however, was that it was extractive. The role of the local people was limited to providing information, while the power of decision-making on the use of this information remained in the hands of others. During the 1980s, NGOs operating at grassroots level, building on the rapid rural appraisal, developed an approach called participatory rural appraisal. These new forms of appraisals use similar methods as the previous ones, but the underlying philosophy and purpose changed. While the previous appraisal methods aim at extracting information, often in a single event, while the previous appraisal approaches aim at extracting information, often in a single event, the new approaches were designed to follow the people's own concerns and interests. Workshops with the new approaches were usually facilitated by a team of trained persons and could take several days, usually three to six days. One of the most important principles of the new approach was the sharing of results of analysis, decisions, and planning efforts among the community members by open and public presentation during meetings. The new approaches strongly supported and facilitated the introduction of demand-responsive ways of managing development interaction and process-oriented thinking. Thus, it built up rural people's own capacities for analyzing their own circumstances, their potentials, and their problems to actively decide on change. The facilitators of the new approach came to see themselves more and more as learners. By the early 1990s, the shifts towards interactive mutual learning was then reflected in the new terminology of participatory learning and action. Since then, expanded concepts of participatory processes have been developed and summarized under the name Participatory and Integrated Development, or PID. To overcome the casual application of participatory methods, PID sought to include workshops and their results in a broader, long-term frame of institutionalized activities. PID means offering facilitation support to locals, such as villages, communities, interest groups, associations, and so on, on a demand-responsive basis, assisting them in having their interests represented, for example, by having grassroots-level planning and action integrated into local and regional planning initiatives. In addition to this vertical integration, PID also tries to enhance horizontal integration, that is, the collaboration of different agencies, sector organizations, and different groups of stakeholders within a region. 
In the 2000s, rapid technological advancements started to facilitate open science practices. Additionally, democratic design and governance practices started to be used across industries, from industrial design to architecture, planning, business management, political science, and so on. These accelerated the development of participatory techniques and gradually turned them into a standalone discipline. Today, participatory approaches encompass interdisciplinary mixed methods used for planning, design, and development such as citizen science, co-design, and social innovation. The use of digital technologies is becoming more and more prevalent in the field. Initially, these methods were mostly used in Scandinavia and some Western European countries, but were gradually adopted across the world and are now often used in emerging economies to facilitate, for instance, infrastructure development by promoting multilateral partnerships and generation of cost-effective bottom-up solutions. The specific methods used for public participation were appropriated from different disciplines. For instance, some research methods from anthropology and social sciences were incorporated into participatory methods, including surveying, ethnography, interviews, and focus groups. A number of engineering and design methods were also incorporated into these methods, including experimentations, observations, prototyping, backcasting, and various generative future thinking methods. Some urban planning and management methods that were incorporated into participatory methods include mapping, benchmarking, site analysis, and monitoring. The key point to remember about participatory approaches is its aim to bring together and involve different stakeholders when implementing these methods. Historically, this was usually achieved through pre-planned workshops and training. More and more, there are many other approaches and tools used to enable participation. Some of the methods require no physical interaction and indirect participation through virtual data sharing. As public participation approaches have gained popularity in numerous disciplines, the methods and tools have also evolved. These methods that are currently used can be divided into two categories, citizen science methods and co-design co-creation methods. Citizen science methods are used in research and analysis-oriented projects. Tools and activities that can be used to enable citizen science include participatory sensing, participatory mapping, open data collection, and open voting practices. Co-design and co-creation methods are used in projects with a need to create particular solutions to already defined problems. These tools and activities include open data initiatives, hackathons, and gaming. Workshops, the oldest and most widely used participatory method, are also the most flexible method. They can be designed strategically and used both for collective research and for collective ideation, co-creation. It's important to understand that these methods are not mutually exclusive. They can be used in combination to achieve project goals. They can also be adapted to meet the needs of the project. Section 2 will present each approach, tool, and method in detail. To make most of the participatory approaches, it is important to select the right tools and methods. There are no clear guidelines and criteria for method selection. The most effective methods will largely depend on the particular project goal. Thus, it is important for project organizers to set clear goals and objectives which are needed to decide which method or tool to use. Importantly, organizers should not be afraid to become creative with the participatory tools. That said, we can broadly categorize the outcomes participatory approaches can achieve into five classes. First, to make more informed and inclusive decisions. Second, to better understand the problems faced by stakeholders. Third, to find solutions to the problems faced by stakeholders. Fourth, to learn and share knowledge on particular issues or practices. Fifth, to engage participants in decision making. Co-design approaches, including gaming and hackathons, are often used for projects where the primary goal is the ideation and creation of solutions and facilitation of decision-making. Citizen science methods, participatory sensing, and mapping are more appropriate for projects aimed at spotting and tracking problems and making decisions. Open voting methods can be equally useful for selecting solutions and ranking problems, enabling inclusive decision-making. Open data initiatives are particularly appropriate for knowledge sharing and longer term and broader community engagement. In terms of cost, if participants have smartphones or computers, open voting and open data practices are the most affordable methods as automation and use of technology is involved. Workshops can be adapted to help both in decision making and knowledge sharing. 
The cost of workshops and participatory mapping can range anywhere from low to very high, depending on the scope and the specific activities. The cost of participatory sensing and citizen science methods can be lower than other monitoring and large-scale research activities, which include centralized facilities, technologies, and professional researchers. In terms of time, workshops and hackathons are typically quick ways to get insights, while technology-based citizen science, open data, and other approaches usually require more long-term involvement. There are a few challenges associated with participatory approaches. First, finding participants that are representative of the population and willing to participate can be challenging. Among both citizens and public-private representatives, initial skepticism towards creative methods can be high. It is a good practice to communicate the value of the project to the candidates from the very beginning. It is also important to make the candidate feel valued, heard, and competent. In particular cases, certain monetary and material incentives can also be useful. Second, when it comes to online tools and crowdsourced solutions, the challenge is avoiding incomplete or inaccurate data, which can skew findings. Therefore, it is important to have a very detailed data collection and analysis plan before starting the project and a critical mind when analyzing findings. Third, when innovative tools and advanced technologies are involved, the execution can be difficult because of the so-called digital divide, which refers to the gap between those who have access to computers and the internet and those who do not. Similarly, technophobia may be another factor that can hinder effective participation. Such people might be willing to participate, but unwilling or unable to use technologies necessary for the project. It is important to first understand the capacities and the mental models of the target audience. Fourth, human involvement and behavior is at the core of all projects where participatory approaches are used. This makes projects unpredictable and uncontrollable. Sometimes, projects can become chaotic and may fail to deliver the intended insights. To mitigate the problem, it is essential to plan each and every step and activity of participatory projects in advance. It is also necessary to keep an open mind, be flexible, and have backup plans for contingencies created by the participants' input and behavior. Fifth, in case where many participants with diverse backgrounds and with drastically different skill sets are brought together, certain communication barriers can arise. In such cases, it is important to prepare mechanisms to help overcome these communication barriers. Last but not least, large-scale projects with participatory approaches can be costly and time-consuming. Participatory projects that require technologies, physical space, and long-term involvement of multiple people can demand funding and demand careful cost-benefit analysis of whether the insights gained outweigh the costs in the long run. In this section, Section 2, we will talk about each tool and method in detail and present many case studies that illustrate how these tools work in practice. Citizen science is a broad term hosted within open science in which citizens can participate in the scientific research process in different ways, as observers, as funders, as analyzers of data, or as providers of data. This allows for the democratization of science and is also linked to stakeholders' engagement and public participation. Depending on their personal interests, time, and technological resources, citizens can decide on how to be involved, observing sightings of birds, identifying galaxies, providing resources by lending computer time, or direct financing as in crowdfunding for scientific projects. Citizen-generated data is a broad category that involves any information that can be collected from people either by active involvement, experience, ideas, votes, or passively, such as wearables that share data or automatically sharing transactions data. One way to involve citizens and get access to citizen-generated data is through citizen observatories. Citizen observatories are community-based environmental monitoring and information systems that invite individuals to share observations, typically via mobile phone or the web. Another way to engage citizens is through training, collaborative fieldwork, and workshops with sets of activities such as participatory mapping, sensing, analysis, and the like. Citizen engagement is also possible through digital media, including social media. The advancement of computing power and emerging technologies enable quick analysis of massive amounts of data collected online. One example that illustrates what can be done with citizen science is the case of the platform I Paid a Bribe. I Paid a Bribe attempts to tackle corruption in India and other countries by tracking bribe payment activities and raising awareness about the nature and spread of bribe-related exchanges. The platform crowdsourced anonymous reports by people who have either paid a bribe, refused to pay a bribe, or who met an official who did not ask for a bribe. 
The crowdsourced reports feed into city, state, and country-level databases of corruption in public services. The Indian website of I Paid a Bribe receives around 25 to 50 reports per day. Many stories are followed up with official investigations leading to suspension of officials involved. The project has now partnered with 25 other countries that have replicated the site. To illustrate the power of citizen science further, let's watch the following three brief videos about its uses and results. One common definition of co-design is collective creativity as it is applied across the whole span of design process. Co-design, co-creation, and co-production are terms that refer to the inclusion of users in the design of products and services. Even though some distinctions have been made in an attempt to give them different connotations, they're generally defined in broad terms covering activities carried out at different stages of the project development and involving people with various degrees of participation. Co-design and co-creation have a close relationship with systems and service design fields. From a service design perspective, co-design activities are framed into a process that moves from the definition of a service idea, the concept, continues with its implementation done with the involvement of stakeholders, and concludes with a service ready to be used. This means that the work of professional designers and planners in this process ranges from engaging non-professional stakeholders in envisioning and co-designing future service ideas, aligning their interests, and empowering them to create self-sustainable services after the end of the design of the project. It's worth mentioning that co-design in and of itself is not a method but a specific results-oriented approach to conception. It might involve a series of creative participatory methods such as gaming, workshops, hackathons, competitions, and fab labs. Citizen science activities themselves may be carried out in the research and exploration phase of a larger co-design project. The key point of co-design is that the involvement of citizens through these methods should result in certain tangible outcomes, artifacts, and not only insights. Co-design is a great trigger and enabler of sustainable social innovation and social entrepreneurship, which are a set of practices that aim to meet social needs in a better way than the existing solution, resulting from, for example, working conditions, education, community development, or health. To illustrate co-design, let's watch the following three brief videos about this approach and the value of democratic design. Workshops are opportunities for designers and planners to untangle a problem together with stakeholders. They can do this by going through a series of group exercises designed to help reach specific outcomes, such as better understanding of problems, their causes, and possible solutions. During co-design and citizen science workshops, typically the stakeholder participants fulfill the role of designers, policymakers, or scientists. But as many of the stakeholders involved may not have enough technical background, expert designers and planners structure and facilitate these workshops to ensure that process moves smoothly and efficiently. The facilitators can organize the training, strategically design series of ice-breaking ideation or prioritization activities, use visualization, planning canvas, and mapping tools to effectively engage the participants. Workshops are about getting stuff done and are often used as a milestone to start things or make decisions. Depending on the project, workshops can last from two hours to several days with one or multiple teams of many participants in natural or lab settings. Collective visualization done during the workshops can help align stakeholders' perspectives regarding needs, expectations, and constraints, and to uncover deep insights that would be difficult through interviews or surveys conducted by researchers. On the other hand, mapping activities such as a system mapping or journey mapping can help understand the problem areas. In the next module, we'll introduce some of the activities that can be used during these workshops. In particular, we'll talk about free listing, network mapping, and modern ethnographic methods such as photo voice. We'll also discuss cases that show how these activities can be used strategically during workshops. Moldovakan is a street in Yerevan, Armenia. Formerly, several public housing buildings were located on the street. The area has changed a lot, and the public housings have become regular residential buildings. As of 2019, 25% of the residents living in the area are refugees. The team at Urbanista conducted research to understand how to redesign the physical space of the community to promote social inclusion and reinvigorate the neighborhood. With in-depth site analysis, interviews, and observations, the group of researchers at Urbanista conducted a series of workshops with the residents of Moldovacan Street. 
During the first workshop, the team conducted contextual inquiries with 42 participants. Contextual inquiries are a semi-structured interview method that allow researchers to get deeper insights about participants' mental models. With this technique, typically participants are first asked a set of general questions and then observed in their natural settings or in the environment about which they're being questioned. When using the technique, researchers can also ask the participants to complete certain visualization tasks or use other generative research techniques. Urbanista's goal with the research activity was to reveal the residents' perceptions of the physical space, people living in the area, and their interactions, and their mental models in general. Besides contextual questions, the participants were asked to sketch the areas and show some of the things that they were referring to in their responses. The team then analyzed the drawings along with textual information and the data collected through other research activities. During the, another workshop, the Urbanista researchers involved children from the neighborhood to tap into the diversity of perspectives of the different demographic sectors, as well as generate innovative, inclusive ideas. Twelve school-aged children were asked to write essays titled, What Would I Change in My Neighborhood If I Were the Mayor? The essays were also analyzed along with other research materials. The participatory activities helped uncover crucial insights about how the presence of cemeteries located near the residential areas affected people's perception of the areas in the neighborhood and their social behavior. It also showed how the historical knowledge about the area and the amount of time that people lived in the neighborhood affected people's current perceptions and behaviors. Putting together all the research insights, including the workshop findings, the team came up with a holistic architectural concept, which above all aimed at tackling the problem of social exclusion, strengthening sense of community among the residents, and providing open space that would create a sense of safety and connectedness. The presence of open, well-lit green spaces were central to the concept. 1. Explore the following links to see a set of activities and tools that you can use during workshops. 2. Think about factors that would influence your choice of activities or tools to use during a workshop. To illustrate the process of such workshops, let's watch the following video of a design thinking workshop facilitated by Kiran Birsetti, the founder of Design for Change, a global movement that cultivates the I can mindset in every child. Participatory mapping is another way to engage the public in development processes. Crowd mapping and public participation GIS are commonly used participatory mapping methods. Crowd mapping is a type of crowdsourcing which gathers data from different sources, including social media, text messages, or geographic data to provide real-time interactive information about issues on the ground. Crowd mapping can create detailed, almost real-time data in a way that a top-down, centrally planned map may struggle to replicate. Crowd mapping can be done to spot problems, identify solutions, or match problems with solutions. Solutions mapping is a method that helps organizations and communities to identify needs, issues, and opportunities by looking for solutions developed by people in response to concrete problems they face. Issues mapping is a visual method that captures the different interconnected issues linked to the central or core issue. Everything is captured on a single map, which helps participants see the issue at a systems level. Both solution mapping and issue mapping can be done by indirectly collecting existing data through digital platforms or by training people to collect and share data. Crowd mapping has several advantages. The insights gained through crowd mapping are usually actionable enough to serve as ideation starting points. As crowd maps include different types of data from different sources, the identified insights are more valid and inclusive. Through crowd mapping, issue and solution maps can be easily juxtaposed to see the larger picture. Depending on particular project goals, several crowd mapping formats and setups can be used. Participatory GIS, or Public Participatory GIS, PPGIS, is an approach to spatial information, spatial planning, and communication management. It enables adding information from users and citizens, adding to expert and policymaker knowledge embedded in many geospatial data. Such information can help decision makers take into account the perspectives and interests of users and citizens. PPGIS has been used in a variety of fields ranging from pasture land management to urban public transportation planning. PPGIS combines a range of geospatial information management tools such as sketch maps, participatory 3D modeling, aerial photography, satellite imagery, and global positioning system data.
It represents people's spatial knowledge in the form of visual or physical two- or three-dimensional maps used as interactive vehicles for spatial learning, discussion, information exchange, analysis, decision-making, and advocacy. In another module, we will cover PPGIS in detail. In this module, let's continue by reviewing a few crowd mapping examples. Crowd mapping first came to international attention through its successful use in the global disaster relief movement. One example is the Syria Tracker Crisis Map, used to crowdsource citizen reports on human rights violations since the beginning of the Syrian conflict in 2011. The map provides detailed metrics on fatalities while preserving the name, location, and details of each victim. The service blends local news reports with on-the-ground reports using hashtags and social media or sent via email. Nearly 5,000 submissions, including over 11,000 fatalities, have been reported since the map's launch, with collected data being used by both development agencies and media to report on local events. The value of solution mapping is illustrated by the case of Honeybee Network. The Honeybee Network, based in India, aims to pool local solutions and facilitate communication among farmers, artisans, pastoralists, and other grassroots innovators all over the world. One of the network's methods for gathering solution involves innovation scouting, where university students are asked to survey local villages for local innovations during their summer holiday. The network has built what is now one of the largest databases in the world on farmer innovations. It is designed for ease of use and provides translations in many languages. A key principle of the platform is that knowledge holders must benefit from the success of their innovations in both fame and remuneration. Participatory sensing is an approach to data collection and interpretation in which individuals use their personal mobile devices and web services or lightweight inexpensive sensors to collectively monitor and systematically explore interesting aspects of their life ranging from health, environment to culture. It also includes the task of collectively sharing and interpreting streams of citizen sense data with other community members, deepening their understanding of the issue, educating participants, and empowering them to act. Let's now review several applications of participatory sensing approaches. One application of participatory sensing can be in transportation tracking. Citizens can map their travel patterns during the course of days, weeks, and analyze them for options reducing their carbon footprint. They can select a goal and try to measurably reduce their transportation impact. The data can be collected through a smartphone application that captures location and time series. Participatory sensing can be used for tracking recycling. For instance, students can document the availability and actual usage of recycling bins around their university campus or in their neighborhoods, analyze what options exist to increase efficacy, and estimate possible savings. The data can be collected through focused, systematic, geocoded, and tagged image capture. Participatory sensing can be used for water monitoring. Villagers can conduct systematic inventories of public sprinkler systems and water fountains and measure their conformance with water conservation regulations or best practices. Participatory sensing can be used for safety monitoring. Citizens can document the safety and comfort of transportation options, including ratings of the bus stops, bus lines at particular times of day, walking paths, and so on. Participatory sensing can be used for health monitoring. Citizens can document tree species and their distribution throughout the neighborhoods, estimate where asthma allergy triggers might occur in spring, and calculate non-allergy running path maps for the neighborhood. Participatory sensing can also be used for tracking daily habits. For instance, citizens can select a personal behavior that they want to better manage and use prompted queries on the phone to report on the behavior several times a day, whether in regards to sleeping, eating, angry outbursts, biting nails, or procrastinating. Statistical techniques can be used to uncover correlations between these behaviors and other factors in their lives. The data can be collected through a time and geocode series of self-reported observations. The case of Ideas for Change illustrates how participatory sensing can be used. Noise pollution is a problem that affects many people living in the central city of Barcelona. Ideas for Change worked with local communities to help them install sensors that measure the harmful effects of noise pollution in their neighborhood. Participants were provided with inexpensive open hardware sensors and then guided through the process of setting up the technology and sharing data with one another. The city council organized public meetings where locals could share their findings and propose potential solutions. Some of the solutions that have been implemented include new flower beds that remove areas where people used to sit and drink into the late hours of the evening. 
The data also helped improve community policing. Let's watch the following brief video to learn more about participatory sensing. Democratic decision-making takes place when a leader gives up authority over a decision and presents a series of options to the group to vote on. The options accepted by the majority of the group is then enacted. Democratic decision-making works well when choices are clear, when the team is well-informed, and when the culture embraces majority rule. Democratic decision-making can be done using different open voting practices and instruments, including wiki surveys. Wiki surveys enable participants to add statements to others' responses. Participants' statements are added to a poll and are then randomly presented back for individual participants to respond or rank. Over time, participants generate new ideas and build a picture of where consensus or disagreement lies. Wiki surveys have several advantages. While regular surveys can limit insights to topics prescribed by researchers, wiki surveys are more fluid and democratic, allowing for participants to add their questions or statements, which can help identify issues that are of concern to the participants and may have been outside of the researcher's view. In this way, this can help gain broader insights from multiple perspectives. Online competitions and polls are also used to enable democratic decision-making. Online competitions are useful for drastically widening the pool of possible solutions to solve a problem. There are numerous free online competition and polling platforms. Considering the increasing number of people using social media, online polling can also be done through such platforms. Open voting does not have to be online. It is possible to open up the decision-making by, for example, conducting dot voting activities during workshops. Dot voting, which allows participants to place stickers or dots next to their preferred options, is a simple tool used to democratically prioritize items or make decisions in a group setting. It is an easy, straightforward way to narrow down alternatives and converge to a set of concepts or ideas. In dot voting, each individual in a group is given a number of tokens, dots, that can be assigned to an alternative. Users, however, need to be aware of the biases they may be introducing if they rely on specific social media platforms, which may have their own unique membership and not necessarily represent the interest of all those who may be affected. The case of Plan New York City 2030 Sustainability Plan illustrates the use of wiki surveys quite well. In 2011, the New York City Mayor's Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability ran a wiki survey where top-voted ideas were integrated into the city's Plan New York City 2030 Sustainability Plan. A platform called All Our Ideas was developed, which used pairwise comparisons as a method to ask crowds to quickly sort and filter proposals. Within four months, around 1,400 respondents provided nearly 32,000 votes and 464 new ideas, many of which the Council had previously not considered. 1. Follow the link below to visit all our ideas platform for wiki surveys. 2. Read about the platform and about the science behind wiki surveys. 3. Click on the gray Try a Wiki Survey button at the top to participate in Plan New York City 2030 Wiki Survey. Feel free to explore the survey results by clicking on the View Results tab at the upper left part of the screen. 4. Click on the green Create a Wiki Survey button and launch your own Wiki Survey. Hackathons are challenge-based events where the organizers define a problem or challenge and participants compete to create a solution. Sometimes this involves a reward. Hackathons bring people together to help surface new ideas or solve a problem quicker. Hackathons can span one or multiple days. They're often semi-structured with a great deal of flexibility and high level of dynamism through attendee interactions. Hackathons typically begin with a meet and greet accompanied by an overview of the event, where organizers review ground rules, expectations, and the code of conduct. This is often followed by project pitches, where attendees can announce a project idea, new or in development, to gauge interest among other participants. The attendees then self-organize into groups, typically ranging from two to six people, each focused on a particular project idea. The bulk of the event consists of open hacking that is, breakout sessions during which group members collaborate on the project. At the event's conclusion, groups present their experience and progress. Sometimes groups present finished products. Often hackathons are centered on technological projects, such as computer software, mobile web applications, user guides, tutorials, and so on. However, they can also focus on social and environmental topics, such as urban development, climate change action, and policy development. They can be organized by for-profit and non-profit organizations, innovation labs, governments, or a partnership of these entities.
An example that showcases how hackathons can be used in the public sector is the case of the Taiwan presidential hackathons. In 2018, the Taiwanese government launched the Taiwan Presidential Hackathon to demonstrate its commitment to open source and open data and to accelerate solutions that address the needs of the country. It invited social innovators to propose project ideas using data and technology. The government provided participating teams with open government data sets and protected data sets upon request. Submissions were judged based on several criteria innovation, social influence, and feasibility. In 2019, 10 finalists were selected from over 100 submissions, with solutions ranging from predictive monitoring of water leakages to a platform for improved knowledge sharing among caregivers. The government has now introduced an international track that invites submissions from all over the world. Let's watch the following brief video on the Taiwan Presidential Hackathon. 1. Check out the following links to the various social, environmental, and business challenges. 2. Take a look at various solution alternatives proposed by citizens. You can also propose ideas about potential solutions to the challenges of your interest and submit them. Open data is the raw data gathered by people or organizations, published in an electronic format readable by machines, shared online, and allowed to be reused by others. There are several ways to open up data or make it accessible to the public. Some of the instruments include data collaboratives, open application programming interfaces, and project wikis. Data collaboratives are a form of collaboration in which partners from different sectors, including private companies, research institutions, and government agencies, enter into an agreement to exchange data for a specific social cause. Data collaboratives aim to unlock new value in private data that would not be exploited otherwise. Application Programming Interfaces APIs, provide the standards by which data is accessed and transferred between websites. Open APIs encourage collaboration and are built using open standards, allowing them to be freely accessed and used. Open APIs are useful both for giving access to researchers to vast amounts of data that can be analyzed and for giving access to innovators to create various applications and tools based on the data. Project wikis are collaborative web pages accessible and editable by all. Project wikis are structured to enable multiple people to collaborate, share knowledge, and improve on each other's work all in one place. A case that illustrates the power of open data is the case of open corporates. Open corporates increases transparency of the corporate world by making information about companies more accessible and allowing citizens and journalists to better monitor companies. Open corporates crowdsources data from citizens who contribute to populating and upgrading the platform, identifying errors, and importing web scraped data. The contributions from all over the world have made Open Corporates the largest open database of company data in the world with over 100 million companies. Public Lab is an open community for citizen scientists. It aims to empower communities facing environmental injustice through data and advocacy. Public Lab uses project wikis to collect information, documentation, and instructions on citizen science projects. These wikis include guides, for example, how to build spectrometers or analyze near-infrared photography. Due to their open nature, the community is able to iterate and improve on the project wikis over time or as new information becomes available. Some of the most active pages have been edited and updated by the community over 700 times. Gamification or serious gaming refers to using game-like elements to make collective intelligence projects more engaging. It's a method that motivates participation in complex topics and can show trade-offs associated with making certain choices. Games can also be useful for presenting data, ideas, and trends. Serious games are used in different areas as they can be applied to a broad range of problems and challenges. A few areas that commonly use games are education, healthcare, urban planning, training, and consultancy. Gamification can also be used in marketing to acquire and retain customers, and by governments to create social awareness. It is important to note that serious games do not necessarily have to be delivered through digital platforms. One example is the case of the 2030 SDGs game. The 2030 SDGs game is a multiplayer in-person card-based game that simulates the real world in the year 2030. Designed in 2016 in Japan, this experience has become a powerful and impactful social phenomenon, earning extensive media coverage and reaching over 100,000 participants. 2030 SDG game events are held in corporate, governmental, educational, and community settings. 
Currently, there are over 600 certified facilitators in Japan and around 50 facilitators globally. Another interesting serious game is Sea Hero Quest. Sea Hero Quest is a mobile game where players' actions help scientists understand and fight dementia. The game asks users to find their way through a digital maze, which then provides researchers with valuable data on user spatial navigation. According to its website, playing Sea Hero Quest for only two minutes generates the same amount of data it would take five hours to collect in a similar lab-based research. As a result, the project has gathered approximately 7,600 years worth of dementia research from players on the app, from around 4.3 million players. Initial results from the data have provided novel insights into spatial navigation abilities across different social groups, ages, and countries. Let's watch a brief video that introduces the game. Another successful gamification example is Quest a Game. Quest a Game takes players outdoors to their backyards, local parks, hiking trails, and other outdoor locations. The task is to locate birds, insects, and other wildlife during specific times of the year. Players can join quests, earn gold, buy supplies, gain levels, build their collection, join clans, conquer territories, move up the leaderboard, and become the greatest adventurer of all time. All sightings are geotagged with the coordinates, date, and time, and submitted to the player's country's national database. The data helps scientists, researchers, planners, and others who have biodiversity-related interests. Let's watch a brief video that introduces the game. 1. Check out the following two links for more serious gaming examples and inspiration. 2. Think about a problem that your community faces, such as lack of public spaces, waste management issues, social exclusion, access to education, and so on. 3. How could you involve people from the community through serious gaming to help address the problem collaboratively? Section 4 will explore how different participatory methods and tools are used in combination in a project with specific objectives. We'll also discuss the results that can be achieved. In 2016, the Mexican federal government granted Mexico City the ability to adopt its own citywide constitution. The initial process allowed very little input by the people and assumed the draft to be prepared exclusively by the mayor. In order to build trust and gather fresh ideas, Mayor Miguel Angel Mancera decided to crowdsource the constitution from local residents. He appointed a 28-person drafting committee made up of Mexico City residents and supported by technical staff to translate ideas into legal language. To solicit ideas for the constitution, the city created a survey called Imagina tu Ciudad, Imagine Your City, to gather local residents' vision for the city. The survey was made available online and offline. The strategy entailed the recruitment of 200 student volunteers armed with tablets to gather responses from citizens in public spaces. In addition to the survey, the city also worked with Change.org to allow people to petition for specific articles to be included in the Constitution. Any idea that gained 10,000 signatures or more were presented to the drafting committee. By the end of the process, the city had collected 26,000 survey responses and 280,000 signatures on 357 petitions. Issues included LGBTI rights, river and lake revitalization, and universal internet access. The constitution was formally approved in February of 2017, with crowdsourced components having an important influence on policy. For Let's explore the success of this method. Having multiple ways to participate, from filling out a survey to writing a petition, encouraged more people to participate. The mayor's commitment to include petitions drafted by the public enhanced legitimacy. At the same time, the mayor made clear that citizen proposals that did not reach the signature threshold would be considered but not automatically included. By clearly communicating these boundaries, expectations were surpassed. Finally, partnership with a well-known brand name, Change.org, increased trust and participation in the process. There were challenges. The main challenge initially encountered was the lack of trust in the process and with the government. Trust was essential to robust citizen participation. In addition, the still-present digital divide in Mexico City created implementation challenges and necessitated offering face-to-face -face participation options. 1. Check out the following links to citizen science project directories. 2. Choose one project that resonates with your interests and contribute to it. Explore additional resources and references below.
This module is developed in the frames of the German-Armenian Network on the Advancement of Public Participation GIS for Ecosystem Services as a Means for Biodiversity Conservation and Sustainable Development, GATES. Visit ace.aua.am backslash gates. The project is financed through DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service, with funds from the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development.